Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I am one of the Ath Fellows this year. In presidential campaign seasons over the last several decades, it's become a bit of a cliche to call an election unprecedented in terms of polarization, divisiveness, and negativity. With each election, it seems that pundits note that this is the nastiest or most heated election of all time. While this may not be true looking at American politics going all the way back to 1776, there's no question that the 2016 election season is truly unique and unprecedented in the context of modern electoral history. On the eve of voting day, Claremont McKenna's own professor, Jack Pitney, will provide his insights on this historic and pivotal moment in American history. Professor Pitney is the Roy P. Crocker Professor of American History and Politics at Claremont McKenna College, where he has taught courses on Congress, interest groups, political parties, and mass media for nearly 30 years. Professor Pitney is a widely published author and co-author of six books on American politics, including The Art of Political Warfare and The Politics of Autism, Navigating the Contested Spectrum. And he is currently writing a book on the 1988 presidential campaign. He has published numerous scholarly articles and short essays and is a regular contributor to newspapers, magazines, and radio programs. Professor Pitney holds a BA in political science from Union College and a PhD in political science from Yale. He received the CMC Presidential Award in 2013 and was named one of the 300 best professors in the United States by the Princeton Review in 2012. As always, audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jack Pitney to the afternoon. Yeah, the uh, uh, unprecedented indeed. Uh, unprecedented in a way that's easily quantifiable. For the first time, we have uh, a major uh, presidential nominee who has never served in public office and uh, has never been in the in military. Every nominee in history has either been in public office or at least served in the military. Uh, Trump has neither of those experiences. And there are many, many, many different ways in which this election is uh, unprecedented. We've never had, for instance, in the New York Post, nude photos of a potential first lady. Uh, there are many, many other aspects that, yeah, well, we're in mixed company and we won't talk about all of them, uh, but let's just say that this is uh, a very unusual election. Uh, unusual not only for uh, the character of the candidates, uh, but also for the uh, character of the campaign, particularly in comparison with people who have run for president in the past. So let's get right into it and examine uh, where the support for candidates is coming from. Uh, this is uh, from the latest polling. The numbers that you'll see tomorrow in the exit polls will be a little bit different, but the patterns will be largely uh, similar. Okay, some of the gaps, uh, not terribly surprising. Uh, African American vote, 82% Dem, 6% Republican. You've seen some polls saying Trump's gonna get 20% of the African American vote. Do not believe them. Not going to happen. Uh, the story here is uh, the following. In the 19, uh, through the uh, early 1930s, the African American vote actually went Republican from the Civil War through the early 1930s, largely as a result of the Civil War. The Democratic Party was associated with the rebellion, with uh, slavery and all the rest. With the New Deal, there was a very substantial shift of the African American vote to the Democratic Party. Nevertheless, for the next uh, 30 years or so, Republicans could get a pretty substantial share of that vote. 1956, Dwight Eisenhower got 40% of the African American vote with the endorsement of Adam Clayton Powell, uh, the famous uh, House member from Harlem. Uh, Richard Nixon in 1960 got about 25% of the African American vote. Now you say 25% is terrible, but uh, in comparison with later showings, not too bad. 
uh, what was the dividing line? 1964. 1964, a Civil Rights Act comes up for a vote in the United States Senate. Barry Goldwater votes no. Uh, with that one vote, there was a, a dramatic shift in the vote. Goldwater gets about 3% of the African American vote in 1964. And ever since then, Republicans have seldom uh, gotten much more than 10%. Uh, Trump is going to underperform from even this low level. Uh, gonna get about 6%. Uh, Hispanic vote. Uh, for years, Republicans have been talking about the Hispanic vote, the sleeping giant. The sleeping giant sleeps no more. Uh, Hispanic vote not only is going to go heavily Democratic, but turnout is going to be higher than ever before. Uh, Latinos uh, ha have made up a growing segment of the population, but if you look at the voting data, uh, Latino uh, turnout uh, among citizens has lagged behind other groups. Uh, this time, uh, Latino turnout is going to be much higher in California and elsewhere, and we'll talk about some of the individual states in just a few minutes. I uh, want to talk uh, at a little greater length here. Uh, white, uh, no college degree, 57% vote for Trump. Uh, now, an uh, important thing about racial voting with the single exception of the 1964 uh, election, the Johnson landslide, Republicans have carried the white vote in every election in the past 60 years. Uh, sometimes really close, uh, sometimes by a larger margin. Uh, so this part is not surprising. What's surprising here is college degrees. This will be the first time since they've broken it down by education that the Democrat, Democratic candidate, is going to carry white voters with college degrees. This is a very important emerging gap in American politics. Gap between uh, voters with college degrees and voters without. Why is it uh, present? Why am I talking about it at some length? This relates to some important economic developments that are really key in understanding the Trump phenomenon. Relationship in recent years between education and economic success. Uh, this is one measure, many, many different measures of this. We could spend uh, the, an entire course talking about this, so this is only a partial view. Uh, these are data from Pew Research. Employment growth is very rapid in areas requiring social skills, analytical skills, very little employment growth in areas requiring physical skills. If you break this down by uh, occupational category, surprise, surprise, manufacturing employment is not robust. Hence, the stories you see about people in the Rust Belt, in old industrial towns, places like Allentown, Pennsylvania, Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, people who used to have really high paying jobs at factories, they don't anymore. And a lot of those folks are flocking to Donald Trump who says, gonna make America great again. Going to bring back the steel jobs. We're gonna bring back the coal jobs. Really hard to see exactly how he's gonna do that but he's talking in a way that other politicians do not, and they find that very appealing. Uh, and you can kind of see where that sentiment comes from, the economic distress that they're under, uh, undergoing. Now, if you look at the top line data, uh, overall economy has been doing too badly uh, since the end of the Great Recession. Uh, GDP is up, unemployment is, uh, is down, uh, and for a lot of people, uh, the economy has recovered. For instance, people like us, people who go to places like Claremont McKenna, well, we're, we're doing okay. Uh, because uh, at uh, graduation time, I read about all the folks getting great jobs at Deloitte and uh, California Capital Fellows Program and all the things that we like to talk about, and that's great, but that's a different reality from that faced by people in the Rust Belt. It's a different world. 
Uh, a lot of you have taken my Gov20 course, and you know that uh, for years I've assigned Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart. And I think that is by far the most important book for understanding uh, current trends in American politics and for understanding the Trump phenomenon. What Murray talks about, and I, I realize a lot of what other things he's written have been very controversial for other reasons, but in Coming Apart, uh, he talks about the decline of working class America and the rise uh, of uh, an elite based on educational attainment. And we see that reflected in political trends. Other uh, data, just to drive the point home. Uh, share, uh, labor share of income, non-farm business sector. Uh, was not doing too badly till the Great Recession. And labor is getting a smaller and smaller share of the income. Where else is the income uh, going? Well, stock market. Uh, if you even know what a 401k is, if uh, you are checking the stock market returns, basically you're in stock market America. A uh, very good chance that you have a college degree or following the Wall Street Journal. And again, stock market's been doing well the past uh, several years. And you're doing okay. If you are a uh, unemployed former steel worker in Youngstown or Allentown, uh, this is not part of your reality. Uh, you're not doing well. Whatever is happening in the stock market doesn't help you. And uh, you're looking for answers. And even if the answers don't make sense to people who have PhDs in economics, they sound very appealing to a lot of people who don't. And numbers like this help explain what's happening with Donald Trump. Another gap, the gender gap. Now this uh, chart requires a little explanation. Uh, these endpoints uh, are about the difference in Republican versus Democratic vote for men and women. Curious thing, uh, in the 1950s, the gender gap was actually, uh, uh, in some cases, reversed. Women were actually more likely to vote Republican than men. Uh, among women, you take the uh, Republican vote minus the Democratic vote is actually 16 points more Republican. What happens? Uh, the gender gap as we know it starts in the mid-1970s. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of literature why this is the case. What issues are driving the gender gap? One of the issues, of course, is reproductive rights. Uh, Roe v. Wade uh, was 1973. Uh, the pro-life movement uh, begins uh, uh, pushing back against Roe v. Wade during the 1970s. That's part of it. Some of it, national security issues. Women taking a different uh, tack on national security issues from men. Whole variety of issues, environmental issues, uh, women uh, being much more sensitive to uh, uh, things like toxic waste, and, uh, which create uh, reproductive harm. I studied that when I was doing my dissertation. Whole variety of issues uh, come to the fore during the 1970s. Whatever the reason is, the gender gap that we know it becomes very evident late 70s and continues unto this day. Uh, and it's particularly prominent in 2016. Men, 13, uh, women, 13 points more Democratic, men, 12 points more Republican. This isn't a gender gap, this is a gender canyon. Gee, why are women not so crazy about Donald Trump? <laughs> wow. Boy, maybe you guys can help me out on that. That's uh, what a mystery. Wow. Uh, obviously, a lot of this is uh, consists of underlying trends. Uh, if the Republicans had nominated, you know, somebody normal. Uh, okay, I'm not going to pretend to be totally objective when it comes to that guy. Uh, 
The, uh, but if the Republicans nominate somebody else, uh, we probably would still have a gender gap, it but it might not be quite as enormous as the one we see here. Uh, and this is going to be pretty significant in, uh, in the outcome of the election tomorrow. So we have, so it's a country that's deeply divided. You have a large number of people who are in deep economic distress, flocking around Donald Trump, who at the, uh, on the other hand is deeply repulsive to African Americans, to Latinos, to women. This is uh, a reshaping of American politics, a reshaping of political parties. As the things Trump is talking about are not the things uh, that uh, Republicans have, uh, have been standing for in recent elections. Republicans until Trump were the Free Trade Party. Uh, in 1993, uh, Bill Clinton took a stand in favor of NAFTA. The only reason he was able to get NAFTA passed through the House was the House Republican whip named Newt Gingrich was able to get enough Republican votes for him to get that passed, and Republicans considered that a great bipartisan accomplishment. Now, of course, Trump is getting the support of Newt Gingrich, who suddenly discovered that he didn't like NAFTA after all. Uh, and uh, Trump is uh, rejecting free trade uh, on foreign policy. Uh, during my entire life, if you thought the Russians were a threat, if you stood against the Russian threat, you were a Republican. If you cheered President Reagan's evil empire speech, you were a Republican. And now the Republican stance on Russia is, hey, never mind. <laughs> hey, they're good people, you know, they, they like me, you know. Uh, that's kind of strange. Remember, the title of this talk is Strange Days Indeed. So, uh, uh, some of you may be fans of the TV series The Americans, and if you wonder whatever happened to Philip and Elizabeth Jennings, uh, the KGB agents, maybe they're helping run the Trump campaign. Uh, uh, so that is a, uh, uh, a huge change in, po uh, in, uh, in the partisan alignment that uh, perhaps we can talk about during the Q&A. Uh, but with this uh, change in the alignment, the big question that everybody is thinking about tonight, what's going to happen? Okay, this is the part you've been waiting for. Okay, my students will be able to look at it. You can take this down and humiliate me on Wednesday by, comparison, uh, by comparing my predictions to the actual numbers. So I want to spend some time going over what I think is going to happen and uh, the reasons I picked uh, these predictions. And uh, the reason I do this, it, it really does give students an incentive to pay, pay close attention <laughs> because they figure if I, if I get it, if I take this down just right and I compare it to the real results, I could really embarrass the hell out of him on Wednesday. I don't care. Whatever gets, the, uh, whatever gets the educational point across, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, it's uh, sort of like sitting in a dunk pond. Uh, it's the political equivalent of that. Anyway, so, for, uh, so I'm going to place myself in the dunk pond right now and say Clinton gets 49% of the vote. Why that figure? Uh, the latest average of real clear politics, uh, po national polls on the popular vote, gives Clinton approximately a three-point edge, uh, which is up from what it was just a few days ago. If you go to real clear politics, which is uh, an aggregator of various news and polls, uh, there was a, uh, a point a couple of uh, days ago where Trump was narrowing the gap and then uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the gap started widening again in Clinton's favor in the national vote. I think it's going to widen a little farther for uh, a couple of reasons. One, uh, Latino vote. Uh, 
as we have seen already in Nevada and Florida, a lot of the folks who are turning out to vote are what the professionals call low propensity voters. People who ordinarily don't show up to the polls and are not likely to show up in likely voter screens. So the actual electorate's gonna be a little different from the electorate that's showing up in the likely voter screens and I'm guessing that that electorate is gonna be a little bit more democratic than uh, the polls are showing. Now, the key word there is guess. It could go in the other direction, too. That's, uh, that's the risk I'm taking in making these predictions because uh, the Trump people are saying there is a whole cadre of shy Trump voters out there who don't talk to the pollsters, don't trust the media, and they're gonna come out in droves tomorrow. Just wait and see. We'll know in 24 hours. For sure. Maybe that will happen. <clears throat> I doubt it, <clears throat> but if it does happen, <clears throat> uh, I'm, well, I'm just happy that my mother-in-law was born in Toronto, which means my wife can claim <laughs> Canadian citizenship, uh, <laughs> which means we can more easily expatriate, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, as Chris Christie said. Uh, <laughs> So composition of the electorate is one reason why I think uh, Clinton's margin is going to be a little uh, wider than the current polls are showing. Number two, and more directly, uh, one point I'm a little more confident in, is mobilization. Uh, Clinton and the Democrats have a very, very, very good ground game. In fact, I know a number of CMC alums who, as we speak, are taking part in that ground game. Uh, calling voters, identifying voters through social media, getting them to the polls, driving them to the polls. Uh, Republicans have been lagging way behind in this for years, and the gap is probably even wider this year than it's been in the past. Uh, now, if Trump really had invested a lot of his money in a serious voter mobilization effort, if once he clinched the nomination back in May, said, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to liquidate assets. I'm going to spend a billion dollars in this voter mobilization effort. We'd be having a very different conversation tonight. But for whatever reason, he didn't do it. I kind of suspect the reason is he lied through his teeth about how much money he has. <laughs> but that's just another guess. Uh, fact is, he didn't do it. Democratic ground game is superior, and I think that's going to add a point. Now you may wonder, why is all this uh, necessary to add a point? And the answer is one point can make a lot of difference in key states. So you take the uh, composition of the electorate, superior Democratic ground game. I think uh, Democrats are going to end up with about 49% of the vote, Trump 44%. Uh, Gary Johnson had uh, high hopes for him at one point. Uh, then we, he actually went on TV. <laughs> What's Aleppo? Uh, at that point, people sort of connected the dots. Oh, yeah, that's the guy who's in the marijuana business. <laughs> and, and so maybe he's the poster boy for voting against the marijuana initiative here in California, but I digress. Uh, uh, Jill Stein, Green Party, uh, the uh, problem for every candidate of the Green Party has been Ralph Nader. Uh, because if I'm a Democrat trying to persuade a Green not to vote Green but vote Democratic, all I have to say is George W. Bush uh, in, in the year 2000. Had Ralph Nader not been on the ballot in Florida, Al Gore certainly would have carried the state of Florida and with it the presidency of the United States and lots of things would have been different. Uh, Democrats are very much aware of that so Ralph Nader's showing in 2000 has been uh, a terrible problem for the Green Party ever since. And uh, during Q&A I think Stein has some other problems as well but um, 
I think 2%, if anything, is generous. And then various other candidates, Evan McMullen, who's on the ballot in uh, Utah, could actually uh, uh, come in second in Utah. I don't think he's going to win, uh, but he's going to get a substantial vote there. Uh, he's on the ballot in some other places. He'll get some write-ins here and there. And uh, the various other cats and dogs you see in the election, uh, they're going to add up to about 1%. So this is my best guess on the popular vote. However, those of you who've taken Gov20 know it's not the popular vote. Indeed, as the entire country learned in 2000, when Al Gore got the plurality of the popular vote, still not the deciding element. Deciding element is the Electoral College. So, without further ado, the Electoral College prediction. Okay. So a lot of these states, not terribly uh, controversial. By the way, I've been doing this since 1988. Jack and Jill remember I, I put together a similar map, 1988 election. I, you know, pretty close back then. Uh, sometimes I've, I've been off in 2004. I was absolutely certain John Kerry was going to win. And in fact, uh, I was so certain Charles Kessler repeated it to William F. Buckley Jr., <laughs> who published it. <laughs> Last time I ever met Buckley, I said, oops. <laughs> but anyway, again, here I am at the dunk pond, and I'm going to stick my neck out. This is probably a slightly higher total for Clinton than some other predictions. I'm not going to go through every state. California, uh, this, in 1988, Bush carried California. This used to be a competitive state. Uh, even in the 1990s, Reeps thought they had a shot here. That's, that's all gone. Uh, not only is uh, Clinton going to win, it, she's going to win by a rubble-bouncing margin that will uh, reverberate down the ticket. Uh, gonna, uh, Trump will be lucky if he gets 30% of the vote here in California. 30%. That's about what the polls are showing. And in fact, among voters 18 to 34, he gets 13% in California which does not bode well for the future of the Republican Party in this state. Well, anyway, I could go on and on about California, but that's deep blue. Uh, Nevada. Uh, a lot of people have thought, well, Nevada is a swing state. No, 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 er early voting. If you uh, followed the uh, developments on early voting, enormous, enormous Latino turnout. Uh, in early voting, and most of the people who follow Nevada politics say it's gone. Uh, so heavily in favor of, uh, of Clinton, no chance that Trump's going to carry Nevada. In fact, uh, we'll talk about the Senate election in a second. That's probably gone for the Republicans, too. Uh, Colorado, we see a pattern here. Uh, very large Latino community in Colorado. Uh, that went for uh, Obama four years ago, going to go for Clinton this time. New Mexico, uh, uh, again, uh, not surprising, heavily Latino and uh, pretty safely for, uh, for Clinton. Uh, Arizona, now if Clinton has a really great night, this is one of the predictions I could go either way on. If Clinton has a really great night, Arizona could go blue too. Uh, Clinton has uh, been behind in most of the polls, but Ari keep an eye on Arizona. I'm calling it for Trump right now, but I, I, my, my reality would not be upended if Clinton carried it. Because there are three groups in Arizona that don't like Trump. One, obviously, Hispanics. Duh. Uh, two other groups, Native Americans. Uh, substantial Native American community in Arizona. Uh, Trump uh, in the casino business has a long history of saying not kind things about uh, Native Americans. And also a very substantial Mormon community. Uh, Mormons uh, kind of look at Donald Trump's life and say, Ugh! <laughs> I like Mormons. <laughs> uh, and then Utah. Uh, uh, Trump probably going to carry Utah, but uh, going to vastly underperform. Uh, Mitt Romney got 70% of the vote. Trump will be lucky to get 40. Uh, if he has a bad night, Mc, uh, if Trump has a bad night, McMullen could carry Utah, but I, I don't think he's going to quite go over the top. Uh, 
Minnesota, Trump uh, campaign in Minnesota. Some of you last week saw uh, my friend Steve Shear. Uh, I talked to Steve about that. Uh, he knows Minnesota politics better than anybody. No chance that Trump carries Minnesota. Uh, uh, Illinois, safely Democratic. Uh, Michigan, uh, there's some, uh, this is closer. I think in the end, the Democratic mobilization keeps Michigan in the Democratic column. Uh, it's not as heavily unionized as it used to be, but you still have uh, some substantial presence of organized labor at large African-American community in Detroit. Uh, and I think that will be enough to keep Michigan in the column. Uh, Ohio, again, this is a closer call because a lot of people are calling it for, uh, for Trump. I think in the end, that's where the Democratic mobilization is going to make a difference, and uh, particularly in the large African-American communities and the large cities uh, in Ohio. Although, again, I wouldn't be totally shocked if it went the other way. Some of these calls are, uh, are kind of on the knife edge. Um, Pennsylvania, I think pretty safely in Democratic column. Republicans always think they're going to have a shot at Pennsylvania because uh, they've seen the deer hunter. Uh, but uh, it's, it's like Lucy in the football, you know, it, it goes Democratic. Uh, North, uh, New York, Northeast, uh, there was some thought that Trump might carry New Hampshire. There's one poll recently, Clinton's ahead by double digits. Uh, so I think she does well in New Hampshire. Uh, go down the, uh, the coast here, a couple of others. Uh, uh, North Carolina, that could go either way. That is really close. I'm not totally certain about this, uh, but Clinton has been leading in polls. I think that's what uh, one state where the mobilization effort's gonna make a big difference. However, 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 uh, Clinton has been underperforming in the early vote among African Americans. Now some of that has to do with uh, the uh, uh, lack of availability of early voting sites. There are accusations of vote suppression. Uh, there's going to be a lot of controversy about that after the election. But if that's true, you're probably going to get a higher than in the past African American vote on election day. Uh, so the shutdown of early voting may shift that vote from early voting to election day. That's what I'm guessing will happen. But I could be wrong on this. North Carolina could go either way. I'm guessing it goes Dem, but keep an eye on it. And finally, the big kahuna, Florida. Uh, Florida in recent elections has been right on the knife edge. It obviously was the state that decided the election in the year 2000 uh, and uh, been seesawing between the parties ever since. Uh, Obama carried it four years ago, but we didn't know until several days after the election. It was that close. I'm guessing it goes Democratic. One, uh, Democrats were lagging in the early part of early voting, but over the weekend, they caught up substantially. Number two, very large and very rapidly growing Hispanic population. In the past, that Hispanic population encompassed many Cuban Americans who t have tended in the past to vote Republican. What's the big difference now? Puerto Ricans large, large, large influx of Puerto Ricans in Florida. And if you're familiar with politics in the Bronx, Puerto Ricans vote heavily, heavily Democratic. Uh, so I think uh, large influx of uh, Hispanics, particularly uh, from Puerto Rico, I think that's going to be more than enough to, uh, to tip Florida. So we talked about the gaps. Uh, Trump got a lot of support in the primaries about talking about the big, beautiful wall talking about they bring crime, uh, they bring, you know, whatever. You know, all the things that people used to talk about, my, say about my Irish ancestors, uh, he's saying about Hispanics. Um, and they're repaying him. Hispanics are saying, oh, okay, yeah, you're going to say those things? Okay, we're going to get involved in politics. And uh, not only is Trump going to get a lesson in Hispanic mobilization, the Republican Party will continue to get that election, that uh, uh, lesson for years to come. 
So I think in the end, uh, vote's going to be 344, 194. It's not, I don't think it's going to be super close in the Electoral College. But keep an eye on some of these states. Some of these states are really close and could go either way. What's going to happen in the Senate? Uh, some states, I think Democrats are going to gain. Uh, Missouri, that wasn't even on the screen, but Roy Blunt is a longtime political insider whose son was governor. People don't like political insiders. Blunt is not a particularly pleasant person, and uh, I think he's going down. Uh, Kander is a very uh, charismatic politician uh, and uh, very appealing, and I think he's going to uh, win. Same uh, dynamic in North Carolina. Deborah Ross, nobody gave her much of a shot at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, but Richard Burr, again, political insider, very vulnerable to it, the same kind of attack that Trump is, uh, is mounting against the political system. There's a common denominator here. Uh, if you're a Republican, but if you s look like the kind of guy that Trump is running against, you could have a problem. So I could imagine a fair number of people voting for Trump, but voting for one of these folks as well, because they're, out, uh, they're perceived as outsiders. Uh, Pennsylvania, a uh, tough state for a Republican. Uh, and uh, uh, six years ago, Pat Toomey won because it was a wave year for Republicans. That wave has receded. And uh, I think she's, uh, she's going to go over the top, in part because the Democrats are going to do a good job of mobilizing their vote for uh, Hillary Clinton. And in Wisconsin, Rusk Feingold, uh, I think, is going to return to the Senate. Ron Johnson defeated him six years ago. Uh, Ron Johnson, not a particularly effective senator. And uh, Feingold is getting a lot of support from national Democrats. And uh, uh, Clinton is going to win Wisconsin, I think, by a pretty sizable margin. That's going to help Feingold. Uh, retentions. At one point, Rubio said he didn't want to run for the Senate again, and then he decided, well, maybe if uh, Trump loses and I'm still in the Senate, things might be a look a little different in four years. So uh, he uh, changed his mind. I think he's going to win. He, uh, polls show he has a pretty good margin. This is a surprise. When Evan Bayh, former U.S. Senator, got in the race, people said, okay, that's it. He wins. Well, it turns out, in between, uh, he had moved away from the state and had been a lobbyist. Uh, people don't like lobbyists. Now, don't tell my wife I said that, because <laughs> she's a lobbyist. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it, it's, it's not a job uh, description that uh, is politically appealing. Uh, and. Uh, as, uh, as Bruno pointed out in class, Todd Young has done a great job of keeping a low profile. <laughs> uh, and just letting, uh, and just getting out of the way as, uh, as Bai's uh, reputation defeats, uh, helps defeat him. This one I'm not absolutely sure on. Uh, New Hampshire, that could go either way. Uh, Maggie Hassan uh, has trouble running as an outsider because she's the governor. Uh, so when you're the governor, it's kind of hard to say, well, I'm a political outsider. Mm, no, no, she isn't. Um, Callie Ayat has uh, gone kind of back and forth on Trump, but I think in the end uh, she, she scrapes through. I'm not absolutely certain about that one. Uh, one thing I'm more sure of is Nevada. Uh, Democrats retain uh, the seat of Harry Reid, who's, uh, who's retiring. Uh, so that leads to if this comes true, a 50-50 tie. So what happens in a case of a 50-50 tie? Actually, we know because it's happened. Uh, this is exactly what happened after the election of 2000. Uh, there are a couple of things. It could happen in a couple of ways. First six months of 2000, uh, Democrats and Republicans worked out a deal that they would split the budgets 50-50 between majority and minority, but the majority would, conti uh, would continue to get the uh, chairmanships. How do you determine who gets the majority? The vice presidency. The vice president is the president of the Senate, so that's the tiebreaker. So if uh, Clinton and Kane are elected, Tim Kane 
becomes very important because he allows the Democrats to have effective control of the United States Senate and the chair of the Judiciary Committee, which is really important when it comes to confirming judicial nominees. So if this, uh, if this scenario comes out, uh, plays out, Republicans are gonna have to think about some things. Hmm, gee, uh, we could have a lame duck session and confirm Merrick Garland, or we could have a Demo contro Democratic controlled Senate and have Hillary Clinton nominate somebody else. Hmm, which of these scenarios is a little better than the other? Uh, there might be some move to confirm Merrick Garland in a lame duck. Now there is a lot of um, there are a lot of glitches in that scenario. The hardline conservatives might not like that kind of agreement, but I'm suspecting that if the Democrats, either in a 50-50 or uh, another kind of arrangement, get control of the Senate, the Republicans might suddenly discover the virtues of, uh, of moving that nomination. That's my guess. The other a uh, possibility in a 50-50 tie is exactly what happened also in 2001, a switch. Uh, anybody recall who switched 2001? James Jeffords of Vermont, who was the most liberal Republican, voted with Democrats anyway, so he went to the Democrats, uh, broke the tie, got a uh, committee chair. Uh, the one Republican to watch would be Susan Collins of Maine. 50-50 Senate, Susan Collins of Maine says, gee, Republicans just nominated uh, the most awful person in the history of presidential elections, and I have the power to decide which party controls the United States Senate. Gee, what do I do? Hmm. Uh, I suspect Susan Collins would, uh, would switch, or at least there would be pressure on her to switch. That's my guess, but that, of course, depends on the 50-50 tie, which is by no means certain. Fearless forecast for the House. Uh, Republicans maintain the majority, but with a very substantial loss of seats. Net loss, I think, is in the realm of 19 seats. And uh, four of those losses are going to occur here in California. Uh, as I said at the beginning, Clinton is going to win by a rubble bouncing margin that's going to take down uh, Republicans. Uh, Daryl Issa, uh, Jeff Denham, Dave Valadeo, uh, Steve Knight, they're all gone, I think. Uh, not only that, I think Democrats are going to get uh, two-thirds majorities in the state legislature, uh, which will give them total control when it comes to taxes and constitutional amendments. Uh, and during Q&A, if you have any questions about uh, other things happening in California, be happy to talk about that as well. Uh, so uh, what's next? What's the future? Uh, to quote Mr. T in Rocky III, pain. Uh, this is not going to be uh, a very pleasant time in uh, American politics. Uh, let's say uh, Trump is elected. Uh, if you consider the way Trump has run his campaign, is America going to be more peaceful? Is America going to be more united? Uh, is America going to be more pleasant with Donald Trump as president? Uh, if you think that, well, then you should be very glad that we're passing Prop 61 and legalizing marijuana. <laughs> Not going to happen. Uh, any Trump presidency is guaranteed to be extremely divisive because Trump is extremely divisive. Uh, but I think that's unlikely. The more likely outcome is that Hillary Clinton's elected president. Uh, She's probably going to, uh, almost certainly going to face a Republican House and a very closely divided Senate. Very hard for her to get her agenda through. Uh, she does have a record of working with Republicans. Uh, there may be certain issues on which she can cooperate, uh, corporate tax reform, uh, a few others. But when it comes to the big ticket items, it's going to be very difficult, especially uh, in uh, the realm of entitlements. Uh, those of you who've uh, studied Social Security and Medicare know that the clock is ticking and ticking louder. 
Social Security is going to reach a point where uh, uh, the uh, benefits are not going to be sustainable. Medicare is also in trouble, not only because of the aging of the population, but because of ongoing problems with health care. These are very difficult choices. Uh, and you cannot solve them, as Trump has suggested, through cutting waste, fraud, and abuse. Not going to happen. Uh, requires serious uh, statesmanship, requires uh, serious bargaining and compromise between the parties. And in a highly polarized Congress, very, very difficult to accomplish that, especially given that Hillary Clinton uh, will start her presidency at a time with deep polarization in the electorate where you have had a candidate leading cheers saying, lock her up. I think about it, we've had a major candidate for president essentially calling for the imprisonment of his opponent. And how are we gonna get past that after that opponent is elected? Um, I think that's damage that's not going to heal very soon. Uh, so um, the very best that we can hope for in the next four years, and I wish I could, uh, could end on a more hopeful note, is a uh, continuation of uh, deadlock on major issues. Perhaps in the midterm election of uh, 2018 or the presidential election of 2020, we can reach some kind of uh, more definitive uh, resolution of these issues going one way or the other. Uh, but for, uh, for the time being, uh, the best you can say is strange days indeed. With that, I will take questions. We now have time for questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and Sarah or I will come to you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, what weight do you give to Trump's comments about uh, not accepting or not conceding the election results? Is that important? Is that something to watch for? Or what are your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, some of that depends on, uh, on the margin. If it's super close, uh, it's extremely problematic. I was just going over uh, before coming here some of the concession speeches in the past. Uh, if you look at John McCain, 2008, extremely moving. He acknowledged the historic character of President Obama's election. And he was just very, very forthright. He told his followers, he said, this, is, this wasn't your failure, it was my failure. And uh, just, just imagine what it took for him to say that after everything he'd been through. And so that was a perfect uh, concession speech. Al Gore in 2000. Yes, uh, they fought the battle in court, went to the Supreme Court. When the Supreme Court ruled, Al Gore gave a speech. The Supreme Court's ruled. Don't agree with it, but I accept it. Uh, I wish the best for the next president of the United States. Absolutely patriotic, absolutely perfect thing for him to say. Uh, if uh, Trump starts talking about the election being rigged, there is some potential for violence. Uh, at worst and at best, uh, undercutting the legitimacy of the next president. So I, I really hope against hope that uh, he does the right thing and gives a, a more normal concession speech. I just hope. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I was just curious about the electoral map, how you had Alaska as blue. And I was ah. just, you didn't really mention it. And yes, it's thank you really for, uh, thank you. That, uh, that's sort of the Easter egg. You found the Easter egg. The Easter egg, now you may wonder, Alaska, Sarah Palin land. Uh, why, uh, did, did I make a mistake? No, that was not a mistake. There are polls showing that Hillary Clinton actually has a serious chance of carrying Alaska. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. One, uh, the anti-immigrant stuff just doesn't sell in Alaska. They just aren't into that. Uh, but more important, uh, Alaska has a very important group that finds Donald Trump particularly repulsive, Native Alaskans. Uh, Native Alaskans who in the past haven't, didn't have a particularly partisan cast, sometimes Republican, sometimes Democratic. Todd Palin, by the way, is Native Alaskan. 
but uh, this time they are really, really, really anti-Trump. So very, very late at night, I suspect we could get a surprise and find that Hillary Clinton has carried Alaska. That's a guess. It could go the other way. But uh, what the heck, uh, give my students something to watch for. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the two Washington state electors who have claimed they won't uh, cast their electoral votes for Hillary Clinton if she carries the state. Uh, one, if there is a wide margin in the Electoral College, it becomes a great trivia question for future Gov20 classes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, if, uh, however, we have a very, uh, let's say my prediction is wrong and you have a really, really close electoral vote, that could be bad, uh, particularly if it tips the uh, election into the House of Representatives. Because if the election goes to that, let's say Clinton wins the popular vote, doesn't quite make it in the Electoral College, the election goes to the House. Uh, it's very likely Republicans will continue to control a majority of state delegations in the House of Representatives, because that's how it goes. It's not a vote of the whole House, it's a vote of state delegations. Uh, and so having the, uh, the House elect somebody other than the winner of the popular vote, I don't think that would be good. Uh, and, of course, that, if that happened, there would be pressure on those electors to stay with the winner in the state. Parenthetically, there's a CMC connection there. Those of you who were around in 2000 uh, will remember that when Al Gore clearly won a plurality of the popular vote, two CMC students got international attention for starting a website trying to persuade Bush electors to flip to Gore on the grounds that Gore won the popular vote. Matt Grossman, now a distinguished professor at Michigan State, and Dave Enrich, uh, uh, equally distinguished journalist for the Wall Street Journal. So, Stag's making a difference. Hi, Professor. Another question about your electoral map. I noticed that you didn't predict any split in Maine. Do you not think that Maine will split any of its electoral votes? I don't think so. Uh, actually, what I should have done is call my niece who lives in Orono, and she could give me the, the lowdown there. Um, for um, everybody here, what uh, Chloe's talking about is you've got two states where you have the possibility of a split in the Electoral College. In 48 states, the candidate who wins a plurality of the popular vote gets all the state's electors. But Maine and Nebraska are different. However, only one time has there been a split. In 2008, Barack Obama got one elector for winning the congressional district surrounding Omaha. And as I told subsequent Gov20 classes, uh, CMC student Caleb Benker worked in the Obama campaign in the Omaha area. So ever since then, I have referred to that as Kayla's electoral vote. <laughs> so potentially, yeah, there, there uh, potentially could be a, a split in Maine. Uh, the more rural of the two districts could go, to, uh, uh, could go to Trump. The polls indicate otherwise, but we'll, we'll, see, on, uh, we'll see tomorrow night. Thanks for the talk. How do we go forward if you're a Republican? Not that I am, but what happens to the future of the Republican Party given all this historic split and what happens to Paul Ryan? Two great questions. Uh, number one, prayer. <laughs> uh, Republicans need lots of prayers. Uh, I. I uh, it's going to be a difficult internal uh, debate. In part, that's going to depend on what Donald Trump does. Uh, let's say he loses tomorrow night. What is he going to do? Is he going to go back to being a uh, uh, New York playboy, or is he going to continue to try to lead a national political movement? If the latter, 
that is, will be disastrous for the Republican Party. Uh, if the former, maybe, maybe, maybe they can get through this. Uh, maybe with the leadership of people like Paul Ryan, they can get back to uh, something ap uh, approaching normality. Because uh, some of the things that Ryan is talking about uh, actually uh, fit with what the party needs to do. We talk about economic distress. Uh, Republicans need something to address the real concerns that are really fueling Trump. Uh, what do Republicans have to offer the retired steel worker, uh, the, uh, the person working at half the pay that he or she used to have before? You gotta have something to offer that person other than a trade war that will kill even more jobs. As to uh, Trump, as to uh, Ryan and the House of Representatives, there's some talk that the Freedom Caucus guys want to get rid of them. The one saving grace is uh, there isn't any obvious candidate to replace him. But if there were, my own preference would be for Ted Yoho. Not because Ted Yoho is a great congressman, he isn't, but because I just like saying Ted Yoho. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Thank you for your talk this evening. You know, being in the business world for a while now and having graduated 11 years ago, it, as the years go by, you get more experience dealing with dollars and cents. And, and being in the tech world, you especially see businesses make it. They go under. The, uh, the, if the scales are in their, in their favor, they make it. And if the scales are not in their favor, they fail. And with the amount of money our government spends, and it seems that it hasn't been much of an issue at all in this election. The scales are clearly seem not to be uh, tipping in the favor of uh, you know, having a budget that makes dollars and cents. So <laughs> what it, it, I would um, appreciate your comments on this, the serious of our national debt and our chances of getting ourselves out of this hole. Excellent question, because the biggest driver of the national debt is entitlement programs, Social Security, and to an even larger degree, Medicare. Uh, and uh, there's a reason why neither candidate has said anything serious. Uh, Trump has said, well, waste, fraud, and abuse. I mean, come on. Social, uh, you know, not in the Social Security system. Now, uh, disability system, somewhat different. There is a serious uh, case for reform in Social Security disability, but that's a separate issue and a much smaller dollar amount. Uh, when it comes to Social Security, here are the options. Raise taxes, cut benefits. There's no third one. There's one or two. They're all uh, some variation of one or the other. They are extremely unpopular. With Medicare, again, which is commingled with a broader issue of health care reform, uh, those of you who have taken my classes, those of you who have studied public policy, it's the classic trade-off triangle of cost, access, and quality. You make progress on one score, you try to reduce costs, it's going to come out of access or quality. Uh, those, it's the brutal arithmetic of entitlements that Republicans and Democrats alike do not want to face but sooner or later they have to. Unfortunately for our country, it's going to be later when the price tag is higher. Hi, Professor Pitney. Um, with both of the major candidates having such high disapproval ratings, it would have seemed like this would be the perfect election for a viable third-party candidate. Can you tell me why that didn't happen? And can you also tell me what would it take for there to be a viable third-party candidate? Uh, the answer to the second question is money, uh, because the system, uh, I hate to say they used, use the word rigged, uh, but the system has a structural bias in favor of the two major parties. And in order to start a major third party, you need a lot of resources. Perot, if he had wanted to, could have followed through during the 1990s. He actually could have financed a third party movement. But after he lost in, uh, in 1996, he walked away. Um, as far as uh, parties in, uh, in this election, 
Gary Johnson did have an opportunity. If he had been better prepared, uh, he would have done better. Uh, the trouble with Gary Johnson is the libertarian message isn't necessarily uh, as appealing as a lot of libertarians thought it was. Uh, that is, uh, uh, smaller government sounds good and, until you start talking about cutting the entitlement programs. And then maybe you say, maybe that's not what we're talking about. Uh, so that was a, a, a problem for him. And also, uh, on certain foreign policy issues, uh, a lot of Republicans aren't crazy about him. There was another candidate, Evan McMullen, uh, who got in very late. He's on the, again, on the ballot in Utah and a few other places in California. Uh, he's a write-in. Uh, he might have been able to make some inroads, but the thing about McMullen is he's running not as a distinctive third-party candidate, but as a normal Republican person. Uh, and so that's not the, the basis for a, a third-party movement. Uh, and, and so really the thing is it takes uh, a message that a lot of Americans regard as, uh, as compelling, but more important than that, it takes massive resources. Uh, so the reality is it would take uh, a self-funding billionaire who wanted to follow through on a third party movement. Thank you, Professor Pitney. Kind of continuing in the vein of that previous question, to what role do you think the uh, voting structure of the United States has to play in keeping us in a strictly uh, two-party system? Do you think things like runoff voting would allow for kind of none of the, well, a vote for Johnson is a vote against Hillary or a vote um, against Trump mentality? How viable do you think that option would be both kind of as a policy in and of itself and becoming a political reality? Uh, yeah, uh, instant runoff voting, uh, ranked choice voting, uh, there's some experiments uh, going on in uh, Oakland, uh, San Francisco. Uh, trouble is, uh, as that system has moved forward, it's generated a good deal of opposition. Uh, a lot of elected officials don't like it. A lot of voters find it confusing. Uh, and so there doesn't seem to be a, a widespread movement uh, to adopt it. I think. Uh, alternative voting systems are fascinating. There's another one called approval voting, uh, developed by Steve Brahms at uh, New York University. Uh, but these just have never caught on. Uh, uh, first past the post voting is deeply entrenched, both in law and in political practice, and it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to get out of that groove. Uh, as far as uh, reforms to uh, the electoral process, obviously, Campaign finance has spawned a thousand senior theses. Uh, I've supervised many campaign finance theses over the years. I expect to continue doing so as long as I'm here. Uh, it's an evergreen topic. Uh, uh, one of the things we can do that would, uh, I, th I think, be a genuine reform of campaign finance that would encourage more participation and possibly more competition, not so much limiting uh, 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 contributions or expenditures, which is legally problematic, but encouraging more small donations to get into the system. Uh, we've seen that in the, ca uh, uh, the potential for that in the Bernie Sanders campaign. And one thing we could do is something was actually tried for a few years in the 1980s, and that's ta tax credits uh, for small donations. Uh, if we could do that, we could increase the flow of small money into the, uh, into the system and that would be helpful to, uh, to uh, candidates who are sort of off the beaten path. Uh, one problem there is, fi is finding a financing system, but uh, the amount of money involved isn't nearly of the same magnitude as we see with, say, something like uh, entitlement reform. It's, it, it's a fixable problem, and it's something that I would strongly support. Thank you for your talk, Professor. Um, I really hear you on the, the economic arguments as to why Trump has been so successful, um, but it seems like either following or underlying his support, or following the economic arguments or, or underlying his support is uh, a cultural aspect as well. Um, the idea that either American values um, are fading or right, like a conception of America is fading. Um, so I was hoping you could speak a bit to that because that seems more difficult to solve than just jobs or uh, money. Yeah, and that's a terrific question. And it's really hard to separate out the two because a lot of the cultural concerns are commingled 
with the economic concerns. Uh, Trump has, uh, has criticized the whole idea of American exceptionalism. And when he's asked about it, he says, well, look, Germany's eating our lunch. He conflates American uh, exceptionalism with economic prosperity. Uh, and a lot of people, as we see in the, uh, in the past year, feel the same way. Uh, in times of economic distress, there's a tendency to blame outsiders. And this is something we saw as far back as the 19th century. What's particularly disturbing uh, about the Trump campaign, not just the economic message, but uh, the cultural message. I, uh, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the line about building the wall and uh, you know, they, they bring crime, et cetera. Uh, but even more recently and ominously, uh, a speech he gave in Palm Beach that he's used as the basis for his, uh, his closing campaign, which contains deeply and directly anti-Semitic overtones. Uh, that is talking about international conspiracy and bankers and the Federal Reserve and uh, in, in many respects uh, literally uh, very close to what Louis Farrakhan uh, was talking about. And uh, that's something uh, that is uh, very, very alarming in American politics and it's alarming that we're seeing a major party nominee flirt with this awful, uh, awful strain on the, uh, on the far right. So it's going to take a long time to overcome that. I don't know what the solution is other than uh, hoping that Donald Trump does not become President of the United States. Uh, hi, Professor Pitney. Um, my question was, so this election has seen a lot of mobilization of uh, groups that predominantly haven't been voting a lot in the past, and that has the potential to really influence the election. Do you think that this uh, mobilization will continue into future elections? And if so, how do you think that'll end up impacting the future of American politics? Yeah, excellent question. And uh, the answer is very specifically uh, Hispanic voters. Um, as I said before, if you look at census data, even leaving aside the citizenship issue, if you just look at uh, Hispanic citizens, uh, turnout has lagged behind that of other groups, non-Hispanic whites, African Americans, and so on. This election, I think those numbers are gonna increase. And yes, it's going to inc uh, it, it will continue because once you're on the voter rolls, once you've registered to vote, once you've cast a vote, you're findable. Uh, by uh, political activists. You will get contacted again. People are going to call you again. And so that, uh, uh, that turnout rate is not gonna go down to where it was before. It's, it's a ratchet effect. It's going to stay up. And uh, the great thing is you're gonna get more people participating in the political process, and that's good for democracy. From the standpoint of the Republican Party is, uh, the problem is most of these folks are gonna be, be voting Democratic. Uh, and that's uh, a, a problem. And more broadly for here in California, and even if you're not a, uh, a Republican, the problem is we are on the verge of becoming a one-party state. Uh, it's gonna be like, uh, some of you may remember V.O. Key's old book, Southern Politics, talking about the one-party states uh, of the South in the middle of the 20th century. That's not good. Uh, it, you, know, you want some degree of party competition. And uh, uh, in part, it's a process that's been going on for some time, but Trump is accelerating it. And we're very much on the verge of becoming uh, like one of the southern states uh, circa 1950 with one party totally dominant. Just think about it. We have a U.S. Senate race in which a Republican candidate couldn't even get on the general election ballot. Uh, if you're a Republican, you have to choose between two Democrats. And you're not even allowed to write somebody in. Uh, you know, I, I just don't think that's, you know, even if you like Kamala Harris, it's kind of good to have, you know, a Republican alternative. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's one reason I worry about California. Professor? Um, so this is the first election that I and probably a lot of people in this room have paid attention, have paid a lot of attention to. So I don't really know if this is, you know, unique to this election cycle, but I know that they're, a lot they're of- They're usually <laughs> a lot better than this one. 
<laughs> I hope so. Um, but I read some analyses that say, like, in this election, people don't just have two sets of opinions. They're using two sets of facts. So do you think that that's uh, something new in this election cycle? And if, tr if that's so, how do we deal with that going forwards? Yeah. Uh, a uh, we, we see the confluence of a couple of, uh, uh, of trends. You're absolutely right. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan is famous for a line that he stole from, from James Schlesinger. Uh, uh, everybody is entitled to his own opinions, but not his own facts. Uh, that's actually a great Daniel Patrick point in, but I agree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, P Peter Scarry, who was his legislative director, confirmed that. Anyway, um, but seriously, uh, what we have, particularly in the case of, uh, of Trump, he just makes stuff up. I mean, so he just, uh, in, in fact, he denies what he thinks that he said 20 minutes earlier. Uh, and a couple of things are uh, uh, enabling this phenomenon. One is the decline of mainstream journalism. Uh, it, uh, pa newspapers are closing right and left. Uh, existing newspapers are a shadow of what they used to be. Uh, and people are just out of the habit of reading their local daily newspaper. What do they get? So they get their Twitter feed, they get Facebook. And what's replacing uh, the old fashioned sources of news and shoe leather reporting are the Twitter feeds and websites, and we're all familiar with friends and relatives uh, who, uh, who send us uh, posts uh, that turn out to be totally fictitious, uh, and it's very difficult to, uh, to overcome this. Uh, there's no simple answer to this except other than to be uh, a discerning and effective consumer of news yourself. Uh, uh, make sure that you bookmark snopes.com uh, because when somebody uh, uh, sends you an urban legend, that's a, uh, a good place to uh, debunk it. But the problem is, a lot of people say, well, I don't believe that. And so uh, we're rapidly approaching what some call epistemic closure, uh, where people just simply do not accept things like science. Uh, and I could go off into a whole different speech, a, a whole set of issues uh, involving science where people are simply in denial. And that's an ongoing problem for our country. Your last question. On the assumption that uh, Clinton wins the presidency and controls the, Democrat controls the Senate, Republicans are threatening to withhold um, approval of a uh, chief or a um, justice for four years. Would you comment on the, you think of the feasibility of the actually doing that? Uh, a lot of, uh, and I think your question is very good because uh, the scenario hinges on which party is in control. If Democrats are in control, uh, we're going to see nuclear option part two. Uh, under the nuclear option exercised by Harry Reid, uh, Senate uh, changed its procedures to end the filibuster except uh, for legis regular legislation, but also for Supreme Court justices. Uh, if that were to happen, we would have the nuclear option exercised in the case of Supreme Court justices. Uh, if Republicans maintain control of the Senate, uh, they are going to have a very interesting political question. Right now, the public is not terribly invested in the issue of Merrick Garland, uh, but if that vacancy goes on, and if there, is, if there are one or two other vacancies, this is the kind of issue that the public is going to get increasingly concerned about. At that point, Republicans are going to face some pressure to, uh, uh, to move on a nomination. Uh, will Clinton then try to pick somebody who is acceptable uh, to the Republicans? Uh, at that, uh, this, this is where the scenarios start getting really interesting and uh, almost fictional because you have to wonder, well, if Clinton were to pick somebody who would be acceptable to the Republicans, would that person lose the support of the more progressive Democrats? Uh, I don't know how that scenario would play out. All I can say is if, uh, if you have a Democratic-controlled Senate uh, and the Republicans continue to try to, to block the nominee, you will get nuclear option part two. Professor Jack Pitney.